I'm Shankar Kumar. I teach history at Hindu College here at University of Delhi. And welcome to this series of lectures on modern European history. I have earlier spoken to you about the uh, broad canvas uh, that constitutes uh, the uh, syllabi across universities in India related to the modern European history. Uh, I did it in four parts and uh, the timeline that uh, I covered uh, for that was the last quarter of the 18th century down to the middle of the 19th century. So, uh, uh, it, it is that timeline that we are now taking up for detailed discussion and uh, the uh, earlier part of this discussion uh, was in the form of French Revolution, uh, the backdrop and this particular lecture of half an hour is about the immediate causes of the French Revolution. In the earlier uh, lecture, uh, which can be, uh, in fact, the two can be uh, seen as a sequel to each other. And uh, there you will discover the, uh, the larger political, social, economic and intellectual climate in which the French Revolution unfolded. And in that uh, discussion, we also took into account the impact and consequences flowing out of the industrial revolution, which was almost a simultaneous uh, process impacting Europe differentially. Of course, it is not related to France per se, but the impact of economy and society uh, was very much there, uh, although it were uh, imperceptible at this moment. Now, in terms of the immediate causes of the French Revolution, if you, uh, if you look at the historiography of uh, French Revolution, of course, it is more than 200 years old now. But most of the commentators who had been the participant observers of the revolution in 1789 and uh, subsequently, or they were, uh, you know, uh, seated somewhere around uh, Europe, outside France as well. Uh, but they were very much seeing it uh, unfolding during their own lifetime. When those people who have written about it, say uh, Edmund Burke in his reflections on uh, the French Revolution, or for that matter, even the revolutionaries like uh, Thomas Paine. So, when you uh, read their impression or their commentaries about the French Revolution, of course, one can say they are not uh, per se a historical account. They did not sit in archives and cull out uh, facts and information in a dispassionate way. But the initial uh, uh, presentation of the French Revolution was in terms of the inspiration that it uh, got from the big booming ideas of the enlightenment scholars, right? So, you have uh, liberty, individuality, equality, sovereignty, republicanism and so forth, division of power in a uh, state, uh, application of reason and rationality to the domain of society and uh, politics. So, loosely, uh, of course, there was that impact uh, very much there. Uh, and it uh, did inspire uh, several of the uh, revolutionaries uh, and uh, their entire vocabulary was ensconced in the vocabulary of enlightenment writers, no doubt about it. But in terms of very uh, immediate political developments, we find that uh, ironically, the revolution began not at the behest of something that the third state undertook, rather it began with the revolt of or it began with uh, uh, some kind of efforts at the level of the nobility, at the uh, level of the clergy. They are the ones who are trying to uh, bring about some kind of uh, innovation. They are trying to tweak the tradition of not taxing the first two orders in the event of some kind of a 
national financial crisis. The monarchy was uh, requiring uh, its coffers to be filled and that was not happening. France had landed itself into uh, a kind of a financial crisis and the traditional way to overcome that was not by taxing uh, the upper two uh, states that is the clergy and the nobility but by somehow resorting to borrowing money from some traders or merchants or the bourgeoisie and so forth. That is how traditionally uh, French monarchy had been bailing itself out of such situations. But as I told you that this is 1789, uh, enlightenment, uh, the, the gush of ideas through enlightenment is very much palpably present. The French public sphere, the civil society of uh, France, the civil uh, population of France had started uh, referring to themselves not as subjects of a monarch which was their political identity but as citizens. So, it had uh, almost acquired uh, a fashionable proportion. They had started talking of uh, uh, human rights. They had started talking of uh, or started visualizing the monarch as the guarantor of uh, the rights of man. right? and uh, constitutionalism uh, and so forth. So, they were very much there, printing press was there, pamphlets were being written. So, the uh, discourse, uh, civil level had already which was taking into account the issues of or the ideas of reason and rationality. So, in the face of this financial crisis that France had landed itself into, when the monarch wanted something to be done by uh, something to be done about it then the first two orders the some of the people in the first two orders they themselves suggested that well uh, it appears very irrational uh, and and it will not pass the test of reason not to tax the first two orders and go on burdening the third state with additional taxes in order to overcome the situation. So, uh, the intractable financial difficulties that were there in the old regime was sought to be uh, overcome in a more reasoned way. Right? Uh, for example, uh, uh, two decades before the French Revolution, of course, all of us know that uh, America had uh, acquired independence in the 1770s and uh, in its war for uh, independence, uh, uh, France had also pitched in against Britain. right? And uh, French participation in American war of independence uh, was uh, not something that was advised by the uh, controller general of finances because French uh, treasury was in a bad shape and uh, uh, he had, uh, uh, he had uh, counseled the king that uh, he should not take this decision. In fact, uh, uh, I have uh, used that quote, the first gunshot would drive the state into bankruptcy. This was the instruction, uh, this was the, uh, this was the uh, counseling given to the king and yet France had participated in American War of Independence uh, and, and it uh, ended up uh, uh, impoverishing its, its uh, treasuries. Uh, over and beyond that, if you look at the financial situation in more immediate context of the revolution, right uh, at the cusp of the revolution in 1788-89. Uh, the financial and economic position of France was tottering. In 1787-88 period was the period of bad harvests and uh, bad harvests obviously would lead to ri rise in bread prices and bread prices are critical. They are like uh, onion prices today in India, they are like uh, uh, the potato prices today in India because everyone consumes it common people, poor people also consume uh, these vegetables. Similarly, 
in France, common people thrived on uh, consuming, uh, you know, bread. And to have the bread prices increasing, obviously, uh, would, would lead to a uh, lot of angst and uh, bad air around the urban dwellers. And that's precisely what happened. It had ripple effect, bad harvests had ripple effect because three-fourths of the GDP of France at this point of time uh, actually uh, came from uh, uh, the agricultural sector. So bad harvests had ripple effect uh, in, in urban economy also and urban dwellers found it very hard, particularly the poor uh, found it very hard to cope with this riding, uh, rising uh, bread prices. July 1788, uh, we also have a massive storm uh, and uh, that had its own share in terms of taking toll on men, animals and crops. So that way also uh, it was uh, 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 incidentally a uh, very bad situation and it all the more exacerbated the uh, the situation, the bad economic situation in France. Uh, it was said that uh, in these bad times uh, for the farm sector, the only farming that was lucrative was the farming of taxes. So tax farming, ta uh, tax collection was farmed out to different people and they were the ones who were making money. The tax collectors were making money. So it's a sarcastic remark that I have alluded to and that tells you uh, about the situation and story uh, right at the beginning of the revolution. The financial uh, deficit uh, situation I just elaborated uh, about France on the eve of uh, the French Revolution. Yet, had it not been for the rising bread prices, the situation would not have deteriorated to the extent it did. Because as I said earlier, uh, uh, financial deficit or financial crisis was not new to monarchies in France. Earlier also, things like this had happened. But there were traditional means and ways by which the situation was overcome. Now it is a different changed scenario. The intellectual climate, I mean, you, you cannot uh, fall back to those traditional methods in a more uh, intellectually surcharged environment where people give value to opinions, where reason is paramount, where rationality uh, is, is the new uh, way of uh, looking at things and so forth. So, uh, these are the uh, due conditions uh, that we have to be. Uh, taking stock of. So, uh, as I said that uh, in their effort to overcome the situation by exploring ways and means of taxing the first two uh, orders of uh, or first two states of French society that is the clergy and the nobility, uh, an assembly of notables was uh, nominated. Uh, in 1787 uh, to suggest ways to overcome this crisis by introducing a tax on all landowners irrespective of their uh, traditional or feudal ranks. Obviously, uh, as per their class interest and also historical orientation of being immune from uh, being taxed, uh, they did not like this idea and the first two orders were up in arms uh, against this kind of uh, this kind of an effort at the behest of the monarchy as well as uh, some people from within their own state or within their own order hence uh, the chamber was dismissed uh, in fact uh, the changed scenario uh, can best be gauged by the statement uh, or uh, this quote uh, from Jacques Necker, who had previously worked as financial advisor to the king. He actually was a Swiss banker and uh, he writes uh, for these times uh, that it is a real monstrosity in the eyes of reason that uh, 
you think of nothing else but to go on taxing the third state, the poorest uh, uh, of the uh, pyramid of social order. So much so that salt, salt tax was also uh, introduced uh, on the third state, the poorest, whose capacity, uh, whose economic capacity was the least. And uh, instead, they were the ones who were taxed the most. And that would never pass the test of reason, as I told you, that now it's a changed scenario, intellectual scenario. Scientific revolution had happened uh, uh, a century before. And enlightenment is about extension of those scientific principles of reason, rationality, empiricism, and so forth, logic, uh, deductive, inductive reasoning, etc., onto the social and political plane. So, such things uh, were uh, now critiqued also. And uh, uh, members from within the first two orders also did not quite see much of a uh, much of a uh, i would say uh, merit uh, in the traditional ways of overcoming uh, such situations so uh, on account of the failure of this assembly of notables to do something about it it was uh, decided that eta general or states generals as we call it uh, in english uh, now, it was an ancient body, States Generals was an ancient body in France. Uh, it was representative all right, but there was no legal sanctity to it. It, it's, it wasn't a legal body, but uh, it was a part of French tradition and heritage, representative tradition and heritage, and it was almost a defunct body. This, uh, uh, this gets revealed when you just have a look at the last time it had met. So, it, uh, Eta General or States Generals in France had met last as early as 1614 and it had not uh, met ever since. Nevertheless, in order to overcome this situation, it was decided that let us call the meeting of States Generals and therefore, a meeting of States Generals was summoned in 1789. Uh, it had representation from all the three orders, the clergy, the nobility and the third state. Of course, the third state was most uh, most uh, populous, uh, highest in number. But as I said that it was a state hierarchized, insulated society with a lot of feudal ethos uh, and grammar. So, uh, the clergy would legislate and deliberate for themselves. The nobility would legislate and deliberate for themselves. And the third state would do it for themselves. So, uh, it was not as if that they were coalesced to uh, legislate and deliberate on issues together as a whole. That was not there. So, it was all uh, believed that okay, if there is a problem, clergy will think what it can do for itself. Uh, uh, nobility will think uh, what it can do for uh, itself. And there is nothing like, uh, you know, national uh, concern. So, when you do the history of nationalism and nation state and nationalities, it is an important point that it is this meeting of states generals where the third state actually took it upon themselves to create a nation out of the deputies or the members of states generals and they would not deliberate and legislate as members of a particular state, but they would do it together as the citizen of a new country, of a new nationality. And that is how national assembly was born, the institution of national assembly was born. Soon uh, elections were held and the representatives of all the three orders who were returned as deputies of national assembly were now not representing uh, their state, but they were there to legislate and deliberate for France as a nation. That is how 
parliamentary representative institution was born. That is how the idea of uh, uh, parochialism gave way to nationalism, which was more uh, accommodating and uh, integrating. Right? So, this is a positive thing uh, or positive instance where you find nationalism emerges by uh, increasing the uh, scope and fold within which it can bring together more number of people. Of course, uh, with uh, similar history and heritage uh, and so forth. So, uh, when this meeting was uh, held or when ETA general uh, or states generals uh, meeting uh, uh, was held uh, in 1789. Uh, of course, it had been decided that uh, when this ancient body meets, uh, all the accompanying rituals and paraphernalia of this meeting would also be followed. But as I told you that the times had changed and it, this was not 1614, the last time it had met. So, when uh, all those uh, activities uh, or uh, all those uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, archaic uh, rituals were enacted. Uh, people, uh, people saw it as uh, as useless. As uh, I mean, it, it was a changed society. It was a more reasonable society. It was a more rational society. The gaze had changed, and uh, by this time, as I told you in the last discussion that uh, despite them still being the subjects of a monarch in France and there was no uh, French revolution uh, happening, yet much before that people had started uh, referring to themselves as citizens and not as subjects. They had started talking of uh, the rights of man, the guardians of the people's liberties and so forth. So, the self image was changing, the political vocabulary, the public sphere uh, activities had uh, significantly changed. It was underpinned by reason, logic, uh, rationality and so forth. So, they found it very odd, they found it very archaic that these rituals uh, were enacted and that uh, symbolized how uh, the situation had changed for good in France. So, there were civil debates around feudal privileges, uh, uh, rights of uh, individuals and the possibility of constitutions and all these I am uh, talking of of the times before the beginning of the French Revolution. September to December 1788, we have 752 pamphlets being published. January to April 1789, the number of pamphlets published increases to 2639. Why I am telling you this? is because that gives you an idea of the intellectual environment, the readership, the increased readership and the network of ideas and scholars that already was in operation in the public sphere, in, in, the, in the civil life of French people. And uh, it is this audience, it is this crowd that has to be satisfied or that has to be taken along whenever any uh, solution to the financial crisis is sought to be uh, uh, implemented. These were the times when opinions counted as much as interests. Right? So, uh, power of idea. Earlier, people thought that everyone would just think in terms of their class interest or their state interest. Right? Uh, if if uh, uh, someone is a clergy, he, his imag imagination would only be uh, uh, circumvented uh, in terms of what is good for clergy and what is beneficial for them. But now, it is a change scenario, it is national. So, one has to think beyond one's immediate uh, class interest or uh, state interest. Right? And that is how opinions are growing. And opinions can be free from one's real uh, state location or class location, they can be free. One can be a clergy or uh, a nobility and yet talk in terms of uh, revolution uh, 
and uh, doing away with feudal privileges. We also have violence, uh, popular discontent, particularly that of peasantry. There were riots in Brittany, Dauphine. Uh, these are all before the start of the revolution. So, in effect, what we get is an interplay of opinion, interest and violence uh, happening before the revolution. Uh, if you look at the profile of the third state deputies, and deputies uh, is just a nomenclature for the representatives of the National Assembly. So, uh, of the total of 648, uh, 166 were lawyers, 85 were merchants, and 278 were government employees. Now, they are the representatives of the third state, which is the lowest order. As is very evident that they themselves, these representatives in these uh, uh, representative institutions, are actually not constituting the constituency, social constituencies that they are supposed to represent. So, there is a vast, uh, you know, uh, number of people who felt dissatisfied with this representative institution also as a solution. They thought that, uh, well, the, the, these guys are not uh, their proper representatives in terms of social profile. And that is what gave prominence to the Parisian crowd. And we have uh, two days of rioting in uh, Faubourg, uh, St. Uh, uh, Antion in uh, April 1789, leading to 25 deaths. This was not against the king, but against local politicians and manufacturers who were uh, favoring lower wages. So, the economics of it, that is why I kept talking of uh, the sensibilities and ethos of the uh, industrial revolution also. Lower wages is something that is no more acceptable to these people, to the Parisian crowd. And they would rise in revolt even against the uh, representative institutions like National Assembly. Right? Uh, Abbe Saez, who was a clergyman, son of a postal employee, uh, not very well off, but nevertheless technically a clergyman. And he is... Uh, uh, he is uh, uh, credited with uh, doing this iconic document, uh, what is the third state and uh, he writes in it that today the third state is everything, nobility but a word. Right? So, um, alongside that uh, in 1788 you have a memorandum from the municipal officers uh, of uh, Nantes, a province in France. Uh, and it says that the third state cultivates the fields, uh, mans the ships and so forth, nourishes and vivifies the kingdom. Uh, it is time that a great people count for something. So, uh, you know, the old order, old regime had to go. And these are just the uh, uh, very, very uh, loud, uh, you know, uh, murmurs and uh, uh, skirmishes and disturbances that uh, underpinned the times uh, immediately prior to the French Revolution. Uh, the, the spoken language had become declamatory as was evident uh, through the courts of Abbe Saez uh, and so forth. Uh, 10th June, the third state carried a motion by 493 to 41 votes proposed by Abbe Saez uh, and uh, that is how uh, the National Assembly was formed. Uh, ultimately, the figure was 491 votes to 89. Clergy uh, uh, decided to join, uh, not the nobility, the uh, National Assembly. 20th June, uh, we know of this tennis court incident, uh, oath of not dispersing, uh, this oath was taken of not dispersing till the constitution of the realm had been established and is strengthened on solid foundations. 27th June, King writes to the presidents of the first two states to join the National Assembly. There is dissension at a court, movement of royal troops in Paris, dismissal of uh, Jacques Necker, who had earlier served as the uh, advisor, uh, financial advisor to the king. Apprehension was there, fear was there, threat of dissolving the National Constituent Assembly was there. Citizens' militia uh, was formed by the uh, top two orders to save or protect their property, but they failed in the face of more fury. 14 July, you have the iconic uh, storming of the Bastille. Uh, uh, several lives were lost, 83 to be precise. Uh, the aristocratic commander was beheaded. It was a very gory, bloody sight uh, that we got to see there. Uh, it reckoned for the first time to the king, Louis XVI, that it is not a riot, but uh, it is a revolution. Uh, 
uh, and then uh, uh, just see the fall of the prestige and uh, uh, aura of the king. The king has to meet the representatives of a new uh, Paris municipal government. Uh, and that's when uh, that new title of mayor uh, comes into being. And this was a symbolic change of, uh, you know, uh, loss of prestige of uh, monarchy and the increased power of the crowd. Uh, Necker uh, uh, subsequently was recalled. There were uh, uh, unpopular landlords uh, uh, who were uh, attacked, uh, present disturbances. Uh, and uh, 4th August, uh, Assembly decrees the uh, abolition of feudal system. National Assembly uh, soon adopted uh, uh, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizens. And that uh, uh, actually, and then uh, there is uh, that great march by the ladies from uh, Paris to Versailles and uh, the uh, king and the queen and uh, their son also accompanied them back from Versailles to Paris. That represented the new, uh, the new uh, uh, changed circumstance uh, with which the revolution had begun. So, in today's lecture, I have uh, uh, spoken of the uh, bigger backdrop and also the immediate context in which the French Revolution uh, unfolded. Thank you.